Welcome to Books Boys, live from the Grand Library, the Dean and PJ. He's PJ. Hello there. Hi, everyone. I'm the Dean, and we are... It's the Dean. We the are... The Books Boys. We are the Books Boys, the one and only. And this is the Books Boys show. Get it? Buy it? Books. Get it. PJ, should we introduce ourselves so that people know what we're doing? Because we've done podcasts Ind- before, right? I- indeed. Uh, shall, shall you go first, or shall I go first? No. So I haven't recorded a podcast in eight years, but I've put out over a hundred episodes of the The Dean Show. I've appeared on two or three other podcasts that no one's ever heard of back in the day. Um, so I'm a, a veteran coming back, you know, going for round two. And you've been doing some stuff more recently, right? Well, I have. I've been following your footsteps because you start off as a young sort of uh, genius in the podcast world. And then you slowly retired. And so I'd, I've taken up your steps and I've... Um, Started a podcast called Can's, uh, Can's Dream, uh, three episodes of philosophical philosophical turmoil and philosophical beauty. Uh, it's all about philosophy, includes some of my music. I do some music as well. And, and the more recent podcast is Feel Good Hit of the Summer, which might just blow your mind. So be careful, because as soon as you start listening to this podcast, you might get terribly addicted to it. It's a music podcast, bringing you music from all over the world. And some strange, quaint characters as well, introducing the show. And there is actually a link to that on our blog, uh, booksboys.blogspot.com, to the YouTube feed. So, so listen to it right now after the show, so you can just go mad. Listen to our shows. And Dean's show is, oh, I'm telling you, it's something else. Only maybe two or three people have heard it, but those, those people, <laughs> the lives have changed for them. I'll forever. be honest, you can no longer find my show. I, I deleted it all what? when I started this one. Um, because you were doing philosophy and good thought-provoking stuff, and I was having a penguin make me tea and complaining that I didn't like wrestling anymore. So it wasn't quite the same level, you know. I, I, th- I thought it was good. <laughs> I thought it was good. Well, let's let's start. So on this show, we're going to talk about the books. Let's take thirty seconds to reset because the kids listening, I don't know if they still know about the books, um, <laughs> with their with their twitters what and is, their MySpace. What is a book? What is a book? So that- you get. You get like some papers with some words yeah. on it, and it tells you a story and makes you happy. Is that is that fair? What do you mean paper? What what's paper? You mean like, like what do you mean paper? Like toilet paper or something like that? Do you mean no? Actual so paper? it's like these little sheets of actual paper. We're going back must, in time. We've got actual books, thing. and they've got little pictures on the front cover and everything. Man, it's brilliant. You should check it out. All right. Uh, well, I think I saw one of them in a museum once. But all right, books. So that's what we're talking about. People, we're talking about books. <laughs> we come from we are. the past. In all seriousness, no, though, quick aside, but would you count um, the online stuff, the Kindle, that kind of stuff, as books? Would you say you've read that book if you've read ah, it on, you've, on a PDF? You've asked me this before. Um, I would count it as a book, yeah, because I mentioned when we talked about that my grandmother, she, you know, she, she can't read a book because she's got bad eyesight, and she can't even hear an audiobook that clearly because of her bad hearing. So I feel like Kindle is... A good invention. So, so look, it's a good invention and to read online. But if you can, I always recommend reading the actual book because I feel like uh, it's just not the same. I feel like reading it from a mobile phone than actually holding the book, um, if I may say so. Like, like you know, smelling the smelling the paper. I mean, that sounds weird. Yeah. But PJ, I've only read a Kindle once. I've only read a Kindle right. once in my life, and it was when I was on my way to visit you in Poland. Um, um, okay. I was on the bus late at night and it was too dark to read my book and I was so clearly distraught that this <laughs> lovely girl gave me her Kindle and said, look, I don't know if you like the book that I'm reading, but you can have it because you're really? so clearly annoyed that you can't read your book right now <laughs> so you can read my Kindle. <laughs> All right. Well, look, that's what I mean. Like, it's not the same, but it is a great invention for, you know, for other things, for people who can't see that clearly or you know, not even people who are don't see that clearly, but you know, I have a, I know someone who just can't see uh, the small letters in the page, so she yeah. just wants to make it bigger. So it's it's it is a good invention, but it's not 
the same, you know. You lose and, a little bit of the aesthetic. You lose yeah. those little, you know, buying second-hand books and he, he, yeah. smelling them and the little notes that people have scribbled inside when they've sent it as a Christmas present but, during World War One or something like that. But, you know, you living in Ireland is a bit easier, but I'm not living in Ireland and I've, I've lived in other places, so it's like um, sometimes hard to find an English book. Then I might actually read something on the phone. Uh, forgive me, Dean. But actually, I can say one thing about that. I find plays, poetry, it's all right to read on the phone if it's something with a short attention span. Yeah. The novels, I just can't read. I don't think I've ever read a novel on a phone. It's too much. for I, I, Just for me, I can't do it. I, I have more attention span with an actual book than on the computer. Yeah, of course. I mean, I had, a, I had a complete collection of Father Brown short stories, and I discovered that there was one story they'd left out of the book, so I read it on my phone. And man, I felt like a sellout. I was waiting to be arrested <laughs> and taken to jail. Like... <laughs> oh, Lord. So, what But let's, you... talk, let's talk about what we've been reading, dude. What, yeah, what have you been reading this month? Well, look, I've got, um, I've got the two books right here. So, I mean, I know you can't see me, but you can see me, Dean. So... I have been reading two books this month, not as much as you have, but I'm a slow reader, to be fair now. And the first one is a classic. Actually, they're both Spanish, um, Spanish language classics. So the first one is La Ciudad y los Perros, which is which is basically the city and the dogs. But it's been translated in English, I think, as the time of the hero, which is a bit misleading. It's not really about heroes. A little bit. Uh, basically, this is a Peruvian classic, or Peruvian classic, and Mario Vargas Llosa won the Nobel Prize in 2010, and it's his best book, considered his best book, and this, this, I've read another book of his he wrote 20 years later and didn't enjoy it, but this book, I'm telling you, this book is uh, the bee's knee, I'm telling you, it's something else, I highly recommend it. And what's the genre, like, what's the style? Um, the style is all right. Basically, it's a it's a Bildungsroman. So, uh, Bildungsroman, just for the listeners, is a type of genre where a person grows up to become a mature person, or basically, an immature person becomes mm -hmm. a mature person. It doesn't have to be a child. And it's about um, teenagers in a military uh, boarding school in Peru in the fifties. And if you ever been in Peru in the fifties, I haven't, but I've, you know, people tell me. No, you should it, try harder, PJ. I really well, thought I you would go to Peru in I, the fifties. You know, before you know, I we did talk time, about the book. I did. I did try to put on the old time trial machine. It was a bit rusty, so I have to get it fixed. I just couldn't do it. I tried to do it before the podcast. Ended up in the eighties. Anyway, but the point is that it's a hell of a society to live in back then. You know, basically a dictatorship, not nice. And being in a military school back then was hell. And the book describes just how hellish. The boarding school is. But what I love about the book, a few things I love about it. First of all, there, uh, it's been considered quite a difficult book because there's not one clear protagonist, but that every chapter switches between more or less five to six, seven um, people. Why I say five right. to six, seven people is even more confusing because some of it's not even 100% clear who is talking and the style changes slightly. So this is like uh, the uh, the uh, literature equivalent of uh, some of the later episodes of Feel Good Hit of the Summer, right? This is... <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. You just Sometimes you don't know exactly who it is. And yeah, but I mean, I, I do love that basically uh, that it's several perspectives. They're all quite different. And another beautiful thing about it is that the psychotic characters, some of them are the soldiers who teach the kids and some of them are some of the kids themselves. The psychotic characters might not be as psychotic as you think, and the ones you think are heroic are not as heroic as you think as you slowly read along. And um, I love that. I think that's why it might be called at the time of the hero, um, because it's just, it's not, the hero is very ambivalent. So, because you're trying to find, you're rooting for one guy at the beginning, then you're actually saying, oh, Jesus, he's actually not so good. So, it's very ambivalent the whole time. And. Cool. And it also switches between times. So it's, there's often a contrast between them having a much more beautiful childhood when they were younger or, mm -hmm. or a traumatic childhood. It depends which character. But, and then it switches to the present 
or to what happened two weeks before that. Know, so it keeps changing at times. I love that in books. I can never follow it in movies. Please, in a movie, just give me a straight A to B plot. Because if you put flashbacks, yeah, yeah. I have no idea what's going on. But in a book, yeah. it works so well. You Because re- you're reading it and you're involved with it and you're living it. And you yeah. you can feel two different plot points. Um, Definitely. But, you know, the the sub-intelligent among us cannot follow that in a, in a movie plot, you know? It's and harder. We'll... Cause... <laughs> Tell us about your, your other book. And well, when I finished reading that book, I I'm I reread well, I'm rereading it now. Cien Años de Soledad, A Hundred Years of Solitude, which is another um Spanish language classic by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who also won This the, one I've heard of. This one I've heard of. Who also won the Nobel Prize, uh, nineteen eighty or, or eighty two, I can't remember. But the idea is I did read this on purpose afterwards because when I was at school, so you know, I grew up in Spain, as you know, dude. And when school, we had a Latin American literature class. And the teacher said there are two classics in Latin American literature. The two books that kind of are basically the father of modern Latin American literature. And that's The dog, um, the City and the Dogs and uh, 100 Years of Solitude. So I just wanted to reread this. They were both written in the 60s. And... Um, yeah, they both started uh, this particular style that a lot of authors imitated all through Latin America, so they're very important. What I love about 100 Years of Solitude is it's a bit different. It's magic realist. I wouldn't say that um, the first and uh, the other one was by um, by Mario Vargas Llosa. But 100 Years of Solitude, it's magic realist. It starts off in a village called Macondo. Um, sometime possibly it's hard it's it's ambivalent the time is ambivalent it sets throughout 100 years that's why it's called 100 years solitude but it's not sure when it's when it's kind of began but i think it's beginning of 19th century i would say and it's just basically uh, a chronicle of 100 years of the buendia family and the buendia family they're quite a family let's just say this and basically what they do and how they live reflects uh, Colombian society around that time because it's a Colombian book. Mm-hmm. So basically, it's Macondo and the Buendia family are seen as metaphors of Bolivia and sorry, uh, Colombia and Colombian society. So and you think you think book. the fact that it takes place over a hundred years has some tenuous connection with the title? That uh, wasn't a wild coincidence. It's, it's not just a wild coincidence. I think, and I think there's a reason why it's solitude. So a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people about this book and they said the ones who read it said it's really depressing i couldn't finish it or how could you read that it took me ages but i find it very funny actually i've laughed out loud reading this book which is but that's hard. because you're that's because you're a sadist right uh it could be could be Dean. i just find it it is it is <laughs> no, funny actually it is funny and uh but the thing is it's tragic as well so it's really a tragic comedy and I, that's my favorite genre you know mm-hmm. between comedy and tragedy and the descriptions are so surreal and magical that it just sometimes it's just a description that makes me laugh. So if Although, you were if you were in ancient Greece, you would like the satire plays, right? The tragic comedies. Indeed, I would. Yeah. So that's my kind of thing. So I enjoy this as well. Uh, that kind of that kind of book. So I'm rereading that, and I'm still enjoying it as much as I have back then when I read it. What about you, Young Dean? What uh, I know you've read quite a few books. This one. Yeah, I mean. I'm, the lines are a little bit blurred over exactly what was this month and what came before yeah, because I've been binging on the, the Brontes. I know, so yeah. that reminds me, before we talk about the Brontes, we need to hear from our sponsor. Do you know that this week, and you wouldn't believe it, is our first episode, and we've already got two sponsors. So the Tell first me. sponsor is the, the new the new wave band that all the kids are listening to on cassette uh-huh. tape. It's Bronte Boom. They got their Bronte new Boom. Sing- yeah, they got their new single, Painting My Brother Out of His Own Portrait. That's the title of the new <laughs> single. And that's out now, Bronte Boom, Bronte in the Disco Text. Get, get it, kid. Get it. And our, our second sponsor, of course, is Anna Karenina, the video game. Now, do you know this? Yeah. It's coming out next week. It comes out next week. It's not out yet. Uh, the platform is the, the PlayStation New. PlayStation and when you no. get this game, it's like Victorian-era Russian Tsarist Farmville. It's amazing. You can play a lot of farming stuff. You can design your farming manual. You've got happy little peasants. Nine again, there's this girl called Anna, and she's falling in love and cheating and suiciding. 
that's kind of a subplot, you know, the guy Dan. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. A lot of farming in this in this game. Great, great well, for the kids. So it's Animal Crossing, and just basically you play you play a, a Russian lady for maybe like ten percent of the game. Is that what I you think ten percent. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, that you should get it. Uh, everyone, just just get it. It's a great thing. You know, it's a great game. Everyone buy it next week on, on the PlayStation. PlayStation. No. So what have I been reading? Well, I just I'm working my way through the Bronte. So I started with the two classics, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights. I'll, I'm not going to talk about them because everyone knows about them, right? So Jane Eyre is brilliant. Wuthering Heights is, I think, slightly less brilliant, but I also see the the genius of it, and that's Grant. Okay. Uh, then uh, I listened to the Kate Bush song plenty of times. Wuthering Heights. Everyone's dancing around. That's great. Uh, now I'm reading the uh, the Anne Bronte. So I think that Anne Bronte, in my opinion, is the better of the three by far, um, because I read Agnes Grey. She's the least popular, right? And you know why? That was because Charlotte, who was the only one left alive, said, "Oh, don't republish Anne's books. No one wants to read that garbage." But you can republish mine and and uh, Wuthering Heights. Obviously, it was too big a hit to kind of say no yeah, to. Yeah, but Wuthering Heights, like her sister had already died. I mean, Emily Bronte by then, so it felt like, you know, so she was just, she was supporting her sister at deceased, but not the one who was still alive. Or what's what's the? No, I think I think Anne had died as well. I think she was the only one alive. But she couldn't deny Wuthering Heights because it was you know too good. But with Anne, she was like, no, just we don't we don't need her, you know. Okay. And this is and this is this is sad because Agnes Grey. It's a very short book. It's only about two hundred pages. Typical governess tale, you know how hard it is being a governess for a rich family who you know treat you like crap. Um, it's all right. But the one I loved is the Tenant of Wildfell Hall. I always pronounce it Wildfell Hall. There's no reason for that in the English language. It's clearly Wildfell. Um, have you read this one? Do you know this one? No, I've only read Woodring Heights, so like the the most famous one. Um, oh, okay. Or what was Jane Eyre the most famous one? But so I have no idea about this book. Uh, just why do you think this is such a good book, even though it's such a well, not well known book? It's just. Anne is so skillful in the way that she writes. It gripped me. Even Wuthering Heights, the first hundred pages, I was kind of thinking, do I like this? I'm not sure. And then it won me over massively. And Jane Eyre was nice the whole way through, but on a, on a level plateau. But The Tenant of Wildfell Hall just came in on top, like, boom. The story writing is great, the characters are great, and it kept me the whole way through. It's just... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the romance. You know I love the romance. Um, the... I'm not going to give too many spoilers because I know that um, it's a brand new book 200 years ago, but the there's a lady in the hall and they're thinking, who is this new lady? You know, they always live out in the moors somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you know, and who is this lady and what are we going to do with her? And then they find that, well, maybe she's married to someone. And back then it's like, well, if she's married, why isn't she with her husband? I saw her talking to a young gentleman. Can't be talking to a young gentleman if you may have been married to someone else. So that's her reputation shot. And this guy falls in love with her, and it's just his story about, you know... But then a lot of it is flashback. Um, You get swindled a little bit. You read about 100 pages, and then suddenly there's like a 300-page flashback, <laughs> which is all set in her past with her husband. And, you know, husband was kind of not nice to her, etc. And you can you can guess the kind of stuff that you have in those Victorian kind of era books, you know. Um, but it all ends happy because I think every Victorian era book ends ends happy, you know. Even the saddest Dickens books have, a, a, you know, and then they got married at the end, you know. It's got, they got to shoehorn that in. <laughs> it's kind of like un, unacceptable to have a sort of more realistic or ending or sadding. It has to kind of end with a, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other one I read was um, Charlotte Bronte's Shirley. This is why I don't like Charlotte. Here's the quick 30 seconds history of Charlotte. So she wrote The Professor, and it was garbage, and no one would publish it. That's fine. Then she wrote um, Jane Eyre, and it got released along with Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey, and that was like a huge hit, you know, brilliant. Everyone loved Jane Eyre. And then she thought, well, okay, now they'll publish The Professor, right? So she brought back The Professor a second time, and they said, no, this is still garbage, though. We're still not going to publish this one. So then she wrote Shirley, which I just read, and I thought that it was garbage because there's a lot of religious philosophy, political philosophy, um, sort of industrial era stuff. It's just the first 100 pages or 150 pages have no real relation to the rest of the story, and it's just a bit disjointed. For me, it didn't really work, and there was not enough romance. Um, and then she wrote Villette, which is on my my list for next week, 
Um, and in Villette, she thought, I know, I'll reuse the elements from the professor. So she's like, they wouldn't publish this damn book like five times, but I'm going to reuse. So there's a character in it called the professor. And that's, you know, some, some story, story elements. elements. And she got that one published and then she died. And that's grand. But, you know, it's like, well, you're a one trick pony, you know, whereas your sister who actually had two and had two good books, you know. And your other sister, one good book, The Wuthering Heights. But I mean, it's just, you know, you got to let go of the bad books. You know, you can't just be publishing. You can't just just say, oh, look, I wrote this book. It's my first book, so I'm going to publish it. You know, sometimes it's just not that good, you know. Mm, But But you know what makes me sad and what turns the tide on that a wee bit? They've also published The Juvenilia. The Juvenilia is some stories, poems, you know, short stories and things that the, the four of them, with her brother, all wrote when they were young. And by some weird coincidence, none of Emily's or Anne's have survived. Maybe one piece, you know, not too <laughs> much. We got a lot of Charlotte's surviving there, and some stuff from Pat from Branwell, and that's nice because we don't have any novels from him, you know. But she's like, well, Charlotte's really overrepresented, and I, and she was the one who said, you know, history, forget Anne. I don't like Charlotte. She's the the bad guy here. She's the heel because I think Anne's doing good work, you know. Well, well, it's just hard, isn't it? Because, I mean, she was the last one to die, so she kind of could decide what to do upon, you know, all her siblings had died before her, so she kind of had, like, the ultimate uh, decision, the, the last mm. the last uh, decision to make. But, but I'm going to read two... I'm going to read two quotes from the Tent of Wildfell Hall. These are designed to show you why I like this kind of literature. So here's here's a quote. At M, they never needed to make up fictional place names, they just put M dash... At M, I had time before the coach started to replenish my forces with a hearty breakfast and to obtain the refreshment of my usual morning's ablutions and the amelioration of some slight change in my toilette and also to dispatch a short note to my mother, excellent son that I was, to assure her that I was still in existence and to excuse my non-appearance at the expected time. I love the way they write. They didn't just say, I ate some bacon and eggs. You know, that... Oh, yeah. There's poetry in it. <laughs> and the second one explains why I love the romance. The the un this is why I like Wuthering Heights, to be fair. It's that that romance that makes you want to tear your clothes and some layers of your skin off and just get on your knees get on the moors and on the cliffs and shout to the heavens. Yeah, you know. Yes. So we have So basically to give you a quick summary of the of the love story, you can't be with her because she's married. Uh, and then she, you know, the, then she's not married anymore. I'm not going to really give too many spoilers, but um, now you can be with her. But he thinks, oh, but she's inherited money, so why would she want to be with me, even though it's been very clear the whole novel that she loves me? Uh, so he then kind of acts like a jerk to her because he thinks, well, this way she won't have to be with me. And she's saying, why are you doing this? Like, it's very clear we we're going to be together. Why are you throwing these hurdles up now? And he's really awkward and shy with her. For literally no reason, and he's I was in agony, mingled love, hope, delight, uncertainty, and suspense. And she gives him a rose, and he takes the rose, and he goes to leave. You know, that is goodbye. And she says, the rose I gave you was an emblem of my heart. Would you take it away and leave me alone here? You know, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Not sure that's appropriate for the kids, do you know? That might be, that might be plus 18, kind of, or at least, at least your parental guidance. Sounds very uh, risque. <laughs> well, it's because the kids don't understand romance or love because they're they're too busy playing um, Second Life and Vine and I, I, yeah I, yeah <laughs> Fourth that's, Life that's yeah. <laughs> whatever the the kids are doing. So we've got to we've got to remind remind the kids though that tomorrow or is it tomorrow? I'm not sure what day it is actually. And more was with the whole quarantine. Someday soon could be today is Halloween, and we got to give some Halloween recommendations. Mm-hmm. So I thought about it as long and hard. It was very difficult to find, um, like, one book that I recommend for Halloween. Do you, but uh, do you want to go first? or? Yeah, I've got mine. In mine I, I read this book when I was, like, 12 years old. Dracula, Bram Stoker. How can that not be your Halloween recommendation? You know, it's it's just... You've got to read it. It's it's not really that long. It's in that Victorian-type era that I love. It's a Dublin writer. It's just... It's a proper classic. you got about a thousand movies based on this book. There you go. There you go, kids. Dracula, I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, available on PlayStation No, I believe. Uh, but also available in the old book format. Have a check out what the book is. Yeah, he's from Clontarf, so that's where my cousins are. Um if you've ever been to Clontarf, I I think you can get a bit of the atmosphere from Vampire. Not that it's a creepy place, but just like you can get because it's like There's bats everywhere and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Just bats everywhere, exactly. <laughs> 
my recommendation, it took me a long time to think of one actually. So I've got two kind of because they're sort of interlinked. Um, my first recommendation is um, Battle Royale by uh, Kushun Takami. All right. And this book is uh, from Japan and it's basically about a dystopian future where Japan is basically a kind of communist state, uh, very much in the sense of very much like Korea, so very much a totalitarian communist state. And, and sort of kind of to teach the kids a bit of discipline, um, they choose supposedly randomly one single classroom each year, and this classroom has to fight each other to death. And the last one who survives gets a big prize money. And basically it's a very cynical concept. Uh, but it's very, um, what's the word? I don't know. I just feel like you could you could um, excuse it as trash or something. But I feel like that's a great sort of moral tale, to be honest. Because actually similar to the uh, City and the Dogs, this has got even more characters' perspectives. But it's it's more coherent, I think. So it's got 40 students. And I think almost all of the students are 42, I think. I think all of the students have their own chapter or chapters. And it's basically them like coming to terms. I mean, how, well, how would you react if you're put in an island and you, you have to kill your your classmates because if not, you be killed. Basically, everyone ha is wearing a collar around their neck, which will explode within a certain time limit. So they one has to be only one person can survive. If two people survive and the time limit arrives, everyone dies. So it's a very much a moral tale, which I which I always enjoy put into extreme it's very macabre it's a very cynical society but the book itself is not cynical i feel the book itself is very kind of um humane perhaps in the sense of it tries to like it's rooting for the kids or trying to solve the game without having to murder each other but okay. i think i saw the movie Oh, the movie's great, too, but the book is obviously a lot more intense. It's a huge book. Like, look, it's like 600 pages. Mm. It's basically the Anna Karenina. Call that, call that a huge book? Do you want me to get some Vandy Ferrites? Almost a thousand pages of droll dinner parties. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but if I can just mention quickly, uh, released in 1999. Uh, this is also released in 1999, which is basically similar concept, also Japanese. It's called The Crimson Labyrinth by Yusuke Kishi and it's the same kind of concept basically except this is more for adults which is basically um, again um, basically I think it's 10 adults are forced to go to a desert in Australia and basically they ha it's the same kind of idea they also have to kill each other but it's a very much a different perspective to Battle Royale mm -hmm. now this one truly is cynical and I think a lot more yeah, as I said, it's basically the adult version. Uh, and might be a better book, I feel. It's a shorter, more unusual setting as well. It's uh, set in the Bogo Bogo uh, desert in Australia. Basically, everything's very red. I think at the beginning, they're in Mars. That's the... That's the, wow. that's the uh, like, like the game planners say that you're in Mars. So they're playing a game called Mars Labyrinth. So that's why the book is called The Crimson Labyrinth, because they're actually in Australia. I assumed Crimson was for blood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Well, that's the idea. It's ba there's a description in it, basically, that it does a lot of um, comparisons between the color, crimson, and blood, and just the landscape. It's very much uh, a lot more atmospheric than Battle Royale. This is very much an atmos atmosphere kind of book. And well, it's great. we're about to hit our half hour. We're almost out of time. I'm going to take 30 seconds, just because it's Halloween, just in one sentence... Um, aside from the books, if you could give the kids a Halloween film recommendation, what would you give? One sentence. Um, Hills of Eyes. I love that. Um, from the director okay. of, as you know, uh, Nightmare of Elm Street earlier. I think that's similar as Crimson Leverance. It's got the same kind of atmosphere. It's atmosphere. It's just, I love the atmosphere in horror movies. And that's thick in, in Crimson Atmosphere. I, myself, I'm actually going to watch, of course, Nightmare on Elm Street, what else? But my recommendation for others, I thought I would give a recommendation for people who don't really like to be scared too much. What do they watch on Halloween? The Comedy of Terrors with Vincent Price, about this undertaker who doesn't have any business, so he's trying to kill this old man to get himself a client so that the 
villagers will pay him to bury the guy he killed, but he can't kill the guy because he keeps waking up. Every time they kill him, he wakes up, and it's hilarious. And he wakes up and he says, what place is this? It's Go and watch it. Um, and that's it, dude. We are out of time. I thought what we'll do is, each each month we will end the, the show with one of our songs, and we can take it in turns, but I thought that, you know, this is the first episode. Why don't we play a song that we did together? It's Halloween. I'm going to take us out with our cover of Don't Fear the Reaper. Sound good? Hell yeah. All right. Grand, congrats man. to this. And we will be back in about a month. We'll be back. So take it easy and read those books. You enjoy oh. it. I watch those two food. Oh! Ooh. Halloween! Take care, kids. What place is this?
Books Boys was presented by The Dean and PJ Burke in association with Thaddeus Penguin Productions. Ah. This episode was brought to you by our sponsor. If you would like to get in touch, you can email us at booksboys at hotmail.com or visit us at booksboys.blogspot.com. The intro uses Driving in the 70s from the Of Soundtracks and Garage Bands EP by Trap Door. And the outro uses Dog's Light by Bravo Max from the album of the same name. All music used is either pod safe or used with permission. Thank you kindly for listening to us. Please tell your friends and come back next time for another episode of Books Boys. Read some books! I think that went rather well, don't you? But I'll be honest with you now, I'm, I'm still not convinced that the kids even know what books are. Right. It's like pieces of paper with some words on, and you read the, the paper. Have you seen that Bronte painting?